Well, very excited for this panel. Um, we have a lot of esteemed guests here. Um, I think just to set the stage here, would be interesting to, you know, work through this panel as like, let's present kind of like the, the work that's being done and then, you know, present almost the shape of the problem or the shape of the public goods and commons problem. And then I think we have a great audience of people here who are very well versed in mechanism design and have worked through some of these things themselves. So I think it'd be good to like, you know, essentially like let's display the shape of the problem, bring some, some of the approaches that have been done so far. And then I would uh, put it out to the audience to kind of like talk to us after about, you know, where areas where you've seen solutions to this or things that should, should be tried um, that could potentially push this work forward. All right. So with that, um, could we get everyone here to just quickly introduce yourselves um, and then provide a quick description of the kind of like commons learning programs that, you know, you're working on, what are you trying to achieve? Just help us set the stage and uh, get up to speed here. I'll toss it to Molly first. Sure. Hi, Molly McKinley. Um, the, the learning program that, that I can talk about today is uh, the PL Launchpad program, which is a six-week onboarding program for new hires to the PL network. Um, we actually have run, I think, five cohorts of this at this point. We uh, initiated and, and ran our first pilot in November of last year. And really what we're trying to achieve is ramping in uh, more new talent, new ideas, new people into the PL network of companies, um, really not looking at this from a single organization perspective, but looking at it across all of the many teams that make up this kind of aligned and collaborative ecosystem. And how can we train, onboard, connect, and match talent to the best place for them within the network um, and doing that kind of on a repeated basis so that we can kind of um, build up culture, build up knowledge, um, and also build up all of the teams across this network that are desperate for amazing new talent to help push their ideas forward. Hey everybody, I'm, uh, I'm Kartik, I'm one of the co-founders of ETH Global, and ETH Global started as an organization with uh, the goal of getting just more developers into building Web3. So it started off with just Ethereum-specific smart contracts and then just expanded to be beyond uh, just smart contracts uh, alone, so we have a lot of elements of other Web3 components and infrastructure that are out there. And kind of as we did these events, which were primarily hackathons and workshops for, for developers, we kind of noticed that there's a large gap between the self-selection that happens uh, for people who are already interested in kind of coming into this space and they're just finding the other people that are uh, in similar interests and kind of um, showing up in the same place to, to work with them. And that sort of got us to a point where we were seeing so many people on the sidelines that uh, were just kind of consuming a lot of these tutorials online because they were recorded. And we kind of noticed a lot of the, the differences between people who were attending, whether that's because they were readily in a sp uh, the, the location that we were doing an event in or uh, were able to catch up online. But the difference between people who were attending the events versus people who were watching what comes out of the event was about 30x. So every thousand people that showed up, 30,000 people were watching these exact developer tutorials. And we kind of noticed that we're still leaving a lot of room on the table from being able to attract and understand why we're not able to reach that audience. And that led us to kind of build something called ETH Global Guides, which uh, we're kind of currently uh, testing and, and launching. And uh, that's a way for people to learn all the same things just on their own pace without kind of committing to being at a place or any given time. Hey everyone, my name is Pooja and um, the project that I can talk about today is called Radius. Um, it's a project by Tefra Labs, which is a company that's building infrastructure for large scale human coordination. Um, and Radius started as a project because we were recognizing, kind of as Molly mentioned, you know, this just dra dramatic need for really skilled talent in a number of different Web3 ecosystems and wanting to provide some of these connecting opportunities between people who are looking for, you know, work in Web3 and getting their careers started um, to actually matching into ecosystems that need talent. Um, and so Radius, uh, what we really believed in, in project-based learning, kind of similar to, you know, the hackathon approach. Um, and so one of the things that we found to be really interesting is that when people are working on projects that are grants from various different ecosystems, they have kind of a, you know, enough runway to actually traverse the learning curve into the ecosystem that they're working on. They build relationships with core developers in those communities. Um, and it becomes like a really powerful way for them to kind of like, you know, the first element that snowballs into future projects and maybe even jobs or companies that they want to start in the, in the ecosystem in the future. Um, and we're also supplementing that with a content library, um, you know, from across many different ecosystems and a fellowship program as well to help people who are like really just the very beginning of their Web3 careers. Perfect, thank you. And I guess my next question, and just start evolving this a little bit, is 
I, I think the, the easy version of this question is like, why do you think that education is kind of like a public goods commons? Um, I think like we can all agree that it's, it's very important uh, for so many reasons. I'll ask that question, but you know, in particular, you know, what is it that's so important for like your ecosystem or your particular project? And like, how do you approach it as like, okay, well, in some ways it's a resource allocation and we can do a million things. Um, why is it so important to, you know, allocate the resources that you need and what does it really mean for your specific ecosystem in particular? Yeah, I can describe about the, the kind of like public good aspect of things. Like why does this, why is this relevant to this audience or this format? Um, I think you can, you know, look at, uh, countries and how countries invest in the learning of their population, things like public libraries, things like public access to knowledge and education as a thing that equips their, their environment, their community with resources that then can help them compete in a global marketplace, generate new inventions and innovations that, you know, improve life for everyone around them. You can kind of make the same analogy to a community or a network that also wants to level up the capability of all of the people in the network, bring in new talent effectively to help grow the, the total amount of things that you can achieve. And so that same kind of like public good of investing in public education is, is relevant at the ecosystem or community or network perspective. Um, and so that is a, as a public good that's available to many um, that then levels everyone up, um, benefits, benefits the whole network and community. Um, and the things that, at least in, in Launchpad, we think are super, super important, we kind of break it down into three main categories. There's the, the core technical learning. Do people have the technical knowledge and capabilities who are, say, coming from Web 2 into Web 3, where they know how to build a website on IPFS, they know how to run a Filecoin node, they understand how these technologies work under the hood, and they're ramped up pretty quickly in you know coming from a different environment to here. Um, then there's kind of the the community knowledge network connections. For us that's you know forming mentorship relationships between like core implementation developers and the people who are going to be maybe committing PRs or trying to make improvements to those things. So we use mentorship as a part of that. We also introduce people into the the how of how things get done in open source projects and communities. So you attend triage sessions for how are we prioritizing all of the different feature requests or bugs within these open source projects. Um, and so really connecting people into a network. Um, and then finally the third the third pillar is culture, making sure that as we grow these networks and communities, we maintain the gravity <laughs> within the community that holds people together. Where it's like, yes, we are aligned. We care about a mission and values and, and things that like help us collaborate and work really effectively together. And we build all of those strong bonds and relationships as an onboarding cohort so that we have like, you know, the affinity, the friendships, the, the um, connections that mean we are a unified community, even across many different different companies within within a wider network that might be focusing on very different things, which then really helps with long-term collaboration, um, like long-term feeling of, of like, yes, I'll go out of my way to help my neighbor. Um, and so those are kind of the three main things that, that we focus on. I don't think I can do better than that. Um, but um, it, it's a very kind of similar answer that I, I have to, and, and the way I would phrase kind of our decisions to kind of go about doing this was from a timing standpoint, which is, we started about five years ago, and uh, that's when you couldn't really find anything um, online. Um, part of what made ETH Global um, become a, a thing was that we really thought this was going to be the, the best thing ever for as a developer, and we just couldn't find anywhere from dedicated efforts to kind of bring more devs in, to have kind of other communities form, uh, and just more generally, like, we didn't have enough good actors in there because if you were to go back 2017 and look at any news on what's going on in the space, uh, there was way more negative than positive stuff. So we said, hey, we think there's way more potential here, and what matters is people doing good things, and starting that type of community and ecosystem takes sometimes decades. And kind of the best thing to do that was, hey, let's make sure that we have an effort around bringing more and more people in and just getting that going, and maybe the fruits will pay off like 10 years from now or five years from now. But uh, what matters is, is somebody focusing on this? Um, and the problem, the approach kind of we took from there was that when you are in a world where anywhere from the programming language you're building on is evolving on a weekly basis, uh, anytime somebody does something, uh, whether it's a blog post or a tutorial or a video, the, the thing gets stale quite fast. And you had all these scenarios where people would look at something, whether it's a YouTube video or a blog post from somebody else, and try to make that work and run, they couldn't get the basic things working. And our approach was to make sure that 
we're fixing the freshness issue first and then use that to actually complement and make that a lot more widespread. So, so that's kind of how we thought about it. Uh, where this kind of ends up doing is uh, fitting in is that overall, it ends up making it easy for people to actually try things before they, in a way, uh, understand if they want to buy it. The most common thing and the, the average profile of a ETH Global attendee is that they're about to quit their Web2 roles, uh, they're all developers, and go into Web3. And they're trying to figure out, is this like actually real? Can I actually think about having a career in here? And if so, what are the nuances? If I'm especially on smart contract side, what changes here, whether it's a framework of how I should think about coding things or how different things work from a state standpoint. All these things are just not obvious until you're actually doing something. And because we're also dealing with money for a lot of these cases, you don't want to find out that you missed something on production. Uh, there's a lot of uh, irreversible consequences for these types of scenarios, and these events become a way for you to experiment. And as we kind of do all of that uh, through these kind of sandbox experiences, which were, were hackathons, we said, hey, we think there's a lot more room to kind of make that even more sandbox and go into guides, which lets you understand how something would behave on production if you were to deploy. And you use that to learn and get the confidence to actually make that jump. Yeah, I, I think, um, yeah, w also just sort of, you know, tying back to the original question as well around like what makes this a public good. <coughs> um, I think there is a really, there's clearly a gap in the market um, today, right, where, you know, there are companies and organizations and ecosystems that really, really need skilled talent. Um, and there are huge numbers of people. I mean, I think ETH, ETH Global has seen, I don't even know, it's probably like hundreds or thousands, or thousands or, you know, many, many people go through these different programs um, because they're looking for these like upscaling opportunities effectively and trying before they buy into a space um, because they want to enter and like, you know, get access to these um, work opportunities down the road. Um, but there's kind of a, you know, companies don't necessarily companies want to buy skilled talent. They don't necessarily always want to invest in like the onboarding and training that's necessary in order to um, take someone who has like all the raw ingredients but needs a little bit of that before they can be really effective in an organization. Um, and so I think some of these programs like fill those gaps. Um, <clears throat> and I think it's, it's really interesting because they're clearly really, really valuable. There's clearly a ton of need for these things, uh, but they are difficult to think about, you know, how, how will these get funded? And the beneficiaries of these programs, which are talent and um, companies that get to benefit from, from skilled talent, aren't necessarily the ones that are supporting um, these types of activities longer term, right? In the case of uh, ETH Global and, and um, Launchpad, these are like funded by ecosystems that are just really generous and know that this is a need and are willing to put funding behind it in order to support these programs. Um, so I think it's like clearly a public good and also has kind of a commons funding <laughs> issue as well, which would be really interesting to dive into. Um, but the value is like sort of undeniable. Yeah. I think you're doing a very good job moderating by that leading <laughs> question there because um, that's something I'm super interested in exploring here is you know, we've talked about there's a lot of value, um, you know, both tangible and intangible, um, whether it's through community and just like onboard, you could see the metrics of like, I am onboarding more teams who are building more on my ecosystem and are therefore creating value that is captured in some way down the road. But it strikes me as there are, you know, some of that is very intangible. Some of that is not necessarily, you know, contained with an ecosystem. Somebody could go to, you know, through my training system and go to another ecosystem, for example. Um, and also it's a very long-term play. It's, it can be multiple years before people um, are getting up to speed and really contributing back into the ecosystem. So I guess where I'm going with this is, to Pooja's point, how do you plan to fund, like how do you set up the right funding structures for these programs and how do you make that sustainable on the long term, um, whether that be you know, exploring new ways to like capture some of the value at the end, um, you know, allocating parts of the community resources pool um, towards these things. I'd, I'd like to hear about the different approaches for, for each of you, especially, I think there's different stages with Pooja. You are starting up a very kind of like high growth um, effort now and are at like different stage than perhaps uh, Protocol Labs and Ethereum. So I'd like to tease that apart a little bit as well. Yeah, I mean, I mean, so far we, we haven't explored all of these things yet. Um, 
right now Launchpad is being funded mostly entirely by Protocol Labs. Um, we sponsor all of the people who go through the program. And, and when you think about like the success metrics or why, why sponsor all of this, it's the collective growth of the network in terms of humans and in terms of capability. Um, it's kind of like what, what we're being measured on from like a, a value creation standpoint. So, you know, how, how effectively do we onboard new humans into the network? What is the, the sorts of impact they are able to do? How quickly in the teams that they match with or the teams they onboard onto? Um, and, and, you know, then collectively as a network, are we creating more impact? And if so, great, success. That is, that's worth um, funding the learning program that then creates that down the road. Um, we're probably only in the early days of like actually being able to like measure and quantify that. Um, you could definitely, we've, we've thought about, you know, future experiments that we might do that we definitely have not done yet, which is something along the lines of, um, you know, for the talent that Launchpad brings into this wider network, you look at kind of the long-term careers and, and pathways people might take between different projects they work on, and then some fraction of the total impact that they create as evaluated by the impact of their various teams, as evaluated by like the performance reviews they might get within those different teams, gets attributed back to Launchpad as an early training and onboarding program that like set them up and matched them to, to a team where they were successful. And you could then imagine every team that they flow through getting that same, you know, uh, recognition for investing in their growth, um, helping you know apply them to uh, to really useful problems, helping them find their next opportunity, and that creates kind of maybe also the incentive for every every group to like be cheerleading someone as they go long term within a network. Um, we haven't yet explored that right now. We're we're still at the early days of build a really amazing program that people love that managers also can like hardcore thumbs up and be like, my people accelerated into the network more effectively thanks to this program. Um, I got net new talent that's able to jump into the problems that I was facing that I wasn't able to find people to fit these problem areas and they are capable and they are um, you know, a great contributor to my team and they're bringing all of the connections in the network to these problems as well. Um, and so really we're looking right now at like, you know, how, what is the efficacy of our learning, what's the efficacy of um, the, the overall network impact uh, that the people go through our program. But we're, you know, on Monday is when our 100th per person joins a Launchpad cohort, so we're still super early. Cool. Um, hmm? from, from, from us, like, the, the way we think about this thing is that uh, ETH Global fundamentally kind of behaves like a marketplace, which is we are facilitating a handful of actors in the system and kind of helping them achieve their goals. Uh, you have uh, we call them contributors in our um, in our kind of network, and if you can look at our chart, there's, there's multiple types of contributors. You have a, a, a speaker, mentor, judge, hacker, uh, just an attendee who's just kind of looking to see if this is something they want, and they kind of go through this engine of different products, whether it's a hackathon or a summit or uh, our guides or just anything else that we're, we're going to do in the future, and that sort of creates more outcomes. So whether it's a project, uh, some of these talks, workshops, um, and that sort of creates more contributors at the end and kind of the engine works by just kind of repeating that loop so you end up amplifying and all of that kind of happens direct to word of mouth and kind of the way we think about all this thing is that we know that the engine is working for the one product that we have figured out product market fit on which is the hackathons and everything that we do ends up supplementing um, the the engine from giving us the flexibility to try more experiments. So when we think about our guide side of things, uh, the goal is to say, look, we already know this, this process and this loop works. Can we get people to now be more involved as one of those contributors? So whether it was a speaker who recorded a 40 minute tutorial on YouTube, can we get them to actually write and and help contribute to a guide that's now written, which has slightly broader reach, is way more measurable. We can understand who actually finished it. Uh, if they're if they're kind of doing that on our on our website, we get to understand. Okay, after they finish this thing, we actually saw them apply to this hackathon, which was offering uh, anywhere from a prize to a talk about the project they just kind of did a guide for, and that helps kind of amplify that loop. And for us, the thinking is that we kind of care about the educational piece and the content itself being public goods. Uh, we don't have to think about making a money because sustainability works from the other product that we do have product market fit on, but there are ways to figure out a way to capture value in the end if we actually get to scale. And right now, the actual number we get to track is that there's about two to 300,000 people that are actively watching our developer tutorials and we have no way to reach them. 
and we think it's a confidence thing, which doing these guides instead of kind of committing to like a week long or a weekend long hackathon, which is intimidating, um, kind of helps offset. And if that loop works, you have a way more opportunity to think about anywhere from career change to job boards to giving out grants, or rather just more specifically, just redirecting them to other parties who can do this much better than us. Um, we don't have to own everything or of the stack and uh, we want to make sure that people are coming in from the right side because we care about curation and especially when you look at people who are going from web 2 to web 3 they are mostly trying to understand what is noise and what signal and uh, we want to do it the best job in making sure they have the first best great impression um, in web 3 yeah um, yeah I think like probably a common model for a lot of these different types of projects will be like you know leveraging the sustainability of another project or system that has achieved product market fit and has a sustainable business model uh, and taking some of the proceeds from that to and pu putting that into other value generating activities that don't necess that aren't necessarily like revenue equivalent generating activities um, is probably a fairly common approach and is practical and I think makes a lot of sense. Um, <coughs> I think for the way that some of what we've been thinking about also is just um, I think Web3 is very unique because <coughs> of this idea of um, you know, community ownership of projects and that also representing financial value as well. Um, and so I think one thing that's like very, something that could be really interesting is imagining um, ecosystems that are benefiting from these types of programs uh, that maybe do have their own protocols and tokens and et cetera, being able to contribute those back um, to in some sort of, you know, split stream. And this is like, you know, would be coming from companies or organizations, not necessarily the people who are, you know, getting employed or working on these projects, um, but being able to con contribute that back to some sort of treasury um, that is managed by these projects. And that in a way um, becomes kind of like an index, like these, these programs can become an index on the value that they're generating in different ecosystems because they're, you know, you know, these really amazing people who are contributing a ton of value in those ecosystems will eventually, ideally, it's kind of indirect, but you know, uh, the protocol layer for all of those ecosystems will appreciate because of the effects of these programs. Uh, and so it kind of, you can then start to see how these, um, these programs can become like indices of the ecosystems that they're indirectly creating a lot of value in much down the road. So I think that's like something, um, like the way that what we're doing with Radius is kind of like trying to be the end point for a lot of these educational journeys as well. Um, and so we, we've been thinking about that um, as one of the ways in measuring the success of what we're doing is really just, you know, taking um, just contribute people who are working on these projects are paid in the tokens for the ecosystems that they're contributing to uh, and us being able to capture a small portion of that value or the protocol being able to capture a portion of that represents the value that, you know, again, indirectly these ecosystems have uh, seen from the people who are doing this work. Um, I think some of the other interesting models, which are some of this is like pi has already been piloted in Web2 and I don't honestly think they've really taken off. Um, but I think, again, Web3 could be an interesting, there's like much more natural ways to implement some of these things um, with like smart contracts. But this idea of like income or revenue share agreements and that, you know, we've seen, I think, analogs in Web3 like split streams and um, just being able to like drip proceeds from some group that is able to uh, receive funds to like the people who've kind of contributed value down the road and that just being kind of an automatic like programmable way to capture value um, back to people that contributed a lot of value in the value chain in the past. So I think some of those models could be really interesting to explore for these different programs too, but yeah. Yeah, it's, it's super interesting how the, there's a common theme of like there's, there's an understanding that like if you build an ecosystem, the ecosystem itself will definitely create, you know, more value is created by these education systems um, than is like put in in so many ways. So it's, you know, it's, it's, it's always a balance, of course, between, you know, trying to measure everything and, and I won't say financialize, but, um, you know, create, you know, completely objective measures of this versus if the community believes strong enough in that there is intrinsic value of this, that there's clearly been and demonstrated, you know, continued effort, whether that's resources and time or, you know, monetary resources, keep on going into this. So it, it's a very interesting case of, you know, do you need to tie in, in like a strict quantitative measurement of it or is it enough that this is something that's like very much agreed on, on the community that needs to continue? I feel like the, the issue is that right now the best we have is a retroactive way of assessing yeah. was something impactful and I think all of our approaches here are in a way trying to make that more proactive so that we can measure in a way like if, if this model or is, is converting and, and if so, like how. Um, so I feel like that's probably the, the framing at least that I think of, which is we know that there are people that do these things and they're somehow coming to 
one of our, our websites to to kind of be part of whatever we're doing how do we know where they're actually coming from and can we make that number bigger um, yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd highlight the, uh, I think we're all in like experimental approaches right now. Like we're, <laughs> we're iterating every six weeks and doing like changes to, to this onboarding program. And so we do need enough metrics that we can understand what's working and what isn't. Um, and, and, and like looking at that from like a network perspective of like, well, are people learning what we kind of hope they were going to learn? Are they matching to grants or jobs or um, coming to future hackathons based on um, kind of the work that they do in this in this program? Um, and we need kind of like a, a gradient there by which we can improve. Um, but I think we, you know, maybe have a, we'll have a much better perspective you know, even further in the future to look back on the value that was generated that we can't necessarily see all of it today. And, and I think it's like, it's clear we're early stage here, but there's a lot of exciting stuff going on here. And there's also a lot of challenges. So with the remaining time, I'd be, be interested to explore, like what are the things that you find are particularly interesting where you have, you're seeing traction, you're particularly excited about this like new concept that you're, you're exploring. And then maybe what's one thing that if you were to ask somebody in the audience um, or somebody who's watching this, where they could, they could really help you solve a problem or a challenge you're facing. I mean, for us, the cohort nature is something that I think is is working really well. Maybe working even better than originally anticipated. Like we have a, a you know a cohort of folks who are all onboarding at the same time, and we get them together in person for a week around um, some wider event that the ecosystem or, or community is having, which then allows you to have strong bonds within a cohort and also stronger bonds like with cohort alumni or other people in the network. So that's working really well for us. Um, the thing that I would love help or advice on is um, some, you know, as we think about trying to like widen the funnel of people who can participate in Launchpad and scale the program over time, um, we'd initially had the hypothesis that to uh, kind of convince people to take the leap from web two to web three, you really needed to offer full-time employment. That was something we'd been seeing from a recruiting perspective at Protocol Labs. Um, and as we try and scale the program, that leads to this challenge of, what offer do you give people <laughs> up front uh, that's not going to then constrain where they might match or constrain you know, whether or not they want to match to a full-time option? Maybe they want to go forth and do radius or maybe they want um, to jump to other areas. And so we're now experimenting with a s eight week contracting offer, which is like contract to hire, or maybe you just do this as a learning program and then jump to doing grants or other things. So we're super still exploring there and I'd love to talk to people who have ideas about how we can you know, maybe do that more effectively or experiment with even other other solutions for scaling. Um, <laughs> sure, I was <laughs> just trying to think, but. Um <laughs> uh, so, ETH Global Guides is on guides.ethglobal.com and we're kind of in the, the phase where we're just getting a lot of bugs out. So, so a few people using it, we're getting ready for our next hackathon with uh, Protocol Labs. So we hope to kind of have a few hundred people try to break it. Um, our kind of thinking back then was, no, back then, a few months ago, was um, <laughs> the uh, the hope that if we kind of make things a lot more interactive, people get to actually try and then understand some of the fundamentals and see how things connect to each other. Um, and I kind of went to a, a few developers and especially kind of most of our, our kind of attendees to uh, get some feedback and, and also to a few protocols that are out there. And the thing that sort of just totally surprised me was the developers were kind of largely indifferent in terms of like, oh, this is great because most of them were on the intermediate to advanced stage. So this kind of first only attracts a lot of the beginners, which is great because that's what we're focusing on. But every company and protocol that I talked to said, hey, we actually have this basically half-assed or just collection of links that we sent to all of our new employees. And this is how they learn how some of these things even on our protocol works or what kind of the general Web3 intro that they need. And we would love to convert some of our internal notes to this format so they can actually provably and uh, kind of follow a whole step to kind of catch up. And they're like, hey, can I convert my internal team notebook uh, or our internal wiki to, to this? And, and that's sort of which is like very counterintuitive because I never expected that to be the answer. And, and that's in hindsight now very obvious because all the people that are coming in are coming in from Web2 and largely they're not somebody who's been in this space for a few years and making the shift. They're kind of jumping right in and they need to catch up on a lot of things. And there's so much nuance in all of this that uh, it takes time. So. That's kind of one thing that I'm like, oh, this is interesting and we want to sort of make that a lot more open. So the thinking here is that 
anytime we do uh, any of the content on guides, uh, the content itself is going to be open source. Anybody can come contribute to it. They're called guides because we want them to be very simple and quick. We don't want to make it a course. You're not learning how to do a full thing from beginning to build a f functioning some NFT kind of marketplace. Like it's these are not uh, academies or courses. You do something super quick, and then they are composable, so you can use that as a prerequisite for another guide and kind of branch off in any direction you want. And the fact that this is open source as content lets anybody kind of update, maintain, contribute, and, and fork uh, from it. And I think the way people can help is basically come and contribute content. Like we are giving attribution to everybody, and most of the comments we've gotten is like, hey, I did this blog post two years ago. I want to update it. Can I just make it on this format? So now I can also see the benefits of who's consuming and who's following through these guides. One of the things I'm most excited about for both of your guys' projects is like the portfolio nature of it, where like you can build up kind of like a knowledge resource that's your past work that um, is either from a grants format or from like, you know, here are the nuggets of, of like learning tutorials and other things that I've done. And so I'm very, very excited for that. I'm going to try and figure out how we can get our Launchpad folks to make use of both of those uh, platforms and, and portfolio building things because, you know, in a long-term learning journey, that is very valuable for like both looking back and for the, the wider community as you have a long-term career between many teams. And I want to quickly uh, throw it over to Pooja. We're, I think we're out of time, but I would love to hear your answer on you know what is really exciting and like what is something that you know the audience can do to help you out or you know this the fun in the commons community can more generally help to like contribute for you. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, so I, I think that uh, you know just quickly to touch on the traction piece because it might be inspiring to some folks um, is really this model of the first project that someone works on that they're paid to do can be such a powerful catalyst for all of the things that happen afterwards. Um, and we've seen that time and time again where people will get their first opportunity and they'll really do a great job because they treat it with so much care because they know that it could be this like, you know, foot in the door for everything that comes afterwards. Um, and then they, you know, then word of mouth spreads that they did a great job and they are connected to so many people and it kind of like, you know, gets them their next gig and potentially their next job. And that's like been such a powerful um, effect. So it's really like, how do we close the gap between what do they need in order to get that first opportunity is really the critical thing. And then you can really trust that a lot of people will be able to take it from there. But that's been something that we've seen um, has worked really well and has been really cool to see. In terms of like, yeah, where I think the portfolio and profiles and reputation, I think, you know, we sort of label all of this as reputation. How do you build up this holistic understanding of who someone is, um, what they are interested in, what they know, um, what they want to do, and then be able to use that to kind of um, help surface relevant opportunities to them. And I think uh, doing that in a way, I, th I think there are a lot of people in Web3 right now who think about this problem um, and are approaching it from really different, sometimes very opinionated angles. Um, and I think figuring out for us, we, we would love to you know figure out how do we do this in a really collaborative way so we don't end up with siloed um, views of a person where really what you actually want in order to help su set someone up for success is this like holistic um, view. And so very excited for the collaboration opportunities too. <laughs> Thank you. We need a notion of transfer credits. <laughs> yeah, between all of our programs and, and yeah, dual exactly. membership between yeah. all of them as well. <laughs> Amazing. Well, thank you so much. Um, I think we're, we're going to wrap it up really quick. Um, Eugene, uh, we'll, ta we'll toss it over to you. But uh, thank you to all our panelists. This has been very interesting. Also, Pooja is hosting a workshop later this afternoon, uh, if you're interested. Um, and there's more details on that outside. I won't, I won't talk to you too much. But thank you again. Thanks. Thank you.